The first migrants leave the jungle camp in Calais in advance of its demolition. They're being moved to refugee shelters across France. The authorities hope 3,000 will leave today. 20 children from the camp have arrived in a town in Devon. They've come from Afghanistan, Sudan and Syria. We'll be live in Calais and Devon with the latest, also this lunchtime. Doctors list 40 common hospital and GP treatments which they say are overused and have little or no benefit to patients. The Prime Minister discusses Brexit with leaders of the devolved governments but says the final arrangements must work for the whole UK. An undercover BBC investigation finds Syrian refugee children are being illegally employed to make clothes for the British High Street. And how heading a football can significantly affect a player's brain function and memory for 24 hours. In the south, the former nurse who fell to her death while under the care of troubled Southern Health. An inquest begins today. And back to where it all began, 60s Soul tours the venues they began gigging 50 years ago. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the BBC News at One. Migrants have begun leaving the camp known as the Jungle in Calais. Queues of people formed at a nearby centre where they're being assessed before being taken to refugee shelters across France. The authorities hope to move 3,000 people from the camp today and to begin dismantling it tomorrow. Simon Jones sent us this report from Calais. They queued from before dawn. After a final night in the jungle, many wanted to be on the first buses out of Calais. Are you happy to leave Calais? Yes, I'm very happy. Why? Uh, because I want to see other life. This life is not good. Jingle. The French authorities describe this as an historic day, the beginning of the end of the jungle, home at the final count to more than 8,000 people. At one point, the queues threatened to get out of hand. Once inside, the migrants are asked to give their name, age and nationality before being taken to centres across France where they can claim asylum. The life here is not good where I was in the jungle. But yes, I, my choice that to go to live to town is better. At times, things have been quite chaotic, with people jostling for place in the queue. So many people have turned up in a short space of time that the authorities are trying to keep everything in order, but it is proving tricky at times. Last night, trouble flared again. Stones were thrown, fires lit, and the police responded with smoke grenades. The French authorities have had enough of migrants trying to get on lorries bound for Britain. But some do not want to leave Calais, which they see as their best chance of getting to the UK. There will be some about, probably about 2,000 people who will decide to stay in Calais, probably, and to continue to go to retrieve your, their families in UK, yeah, probably. The bulldozers could start ripping the jungle down as early as tomorrow. This is an operation which we hope to see unfold in a calm and controlled manner within the framework we have established. That is currently the case. And we will do everything for this to be up to our country's standards. The authorities are hoping 3,000 migrants will be moved from Calais today. But camps have been closed in the past and new ones have always sprung up. For many, getting to Britain remains the ultimate goal. And let's talk to Simon at the camp. Do you feel, Simon, the authorities are going to get the result that they want by the end of the day? Well, the authorities wanted people to come here in their numbers, and they have. But in truth, I think they've been slightly overwhelmed because in the past hour or so, the chief of police here in Calais has been going right along the queue here, telling some of the migrants that they may not get on buses today because so many people have turned up. He suggested they should head back up in that direction towards the jungle and come back tomorrow. Now, so far, 900 people have been bussed away to various parts of France. 
so far 23 coaches have left. We're told during the day they hope to get 60 buses away and that would potentially be 3,000 people. But the people here are the people who want to leave. They've come voluntarily for the jungle. What's not clear is how many people will resist and decide they want to stay in the jungle. And that's when things could get difficult with the police. We've got 1,250 officers taking part in this operation to try to keep the calm. But some of the migrants are saying they may attempt to stay in the jungle, or if that's not possible, they may simply end up sleeping rough on the streets because they don't want to go further away from Calais because that takes them further away from their dream of getting to the UK. But equally, many I'm speaking to, many of the people in the queue here today have had enough of the squalor and the damp and the dirt of the jungle, and they have decided anything is better than this. So they will start a new life far away from here in other parts of France. Simon, many thanks. Simon Jones there in Calais. Well, 20 child migrants from that camp have arrived at a residential centre in North Devon. The youngsters, who were all believed to be male and under the age of 18, arrived at about 3 o'clock this morning. Let's talk to our correspondent Sarah Ransom, who is in Great Torrington. And what is going to happen to this group, Sarah? Well, the 20 uh, or so young boys arrived this morning, as you say. We're told they're all uh, young boys. They're all, the Home Office say, under the age of 18, mainly from Afghanistan and from Syria. And they'll be here, well, for as long as it takes, really. But we're told some will be here just for a few days. Some will be here for up to six weeks, uh, one local MP has told me. The facility itself can take up to 70 uh, young people. But at the moment, as you say, only 20 have arrived. They came in the early hours of this morning. Now, while they're here, they will be checked over to see if they need any medical help, any psychiatric psychological help and if that's required that will be given while the process goes on to see where they go from here. Now it is primarily a home office operation. The local council, Devon County Council, are helping out with that along with other agencies. Everyone is stressing that the young people that have come here already are vulnerable, that they've been in a very difficult situation and they're asking for their privacy to be uh, res respected. Sarah, thank you. Sarah Ransom. Senior doctors have produced a list of 40 treatments and procedures which they say offer little or no benefit to patients. The list includes x-rays for lower back pain and plaster casts for children with small wrist fractures. The Academy of Medical Royal Colleges says it wants to reduce the number of unnecessary treatments. Our health editor, Hugh Pym, reports. There's an increasing debate on what's been called overdiagnosis and overtreatment, and whether there's too much medication on offer to patients. It comes at a time of growing pressure on NHS finances. The Academy of Medical Royal Colleges asked members around the UK for a list of unnecessary remedies and treatments. They came up with 40. The list of those said to bring little or no benefit includes plaster casts for children's small wrist fractures, the use of saline solution to clean cuts and grazes, tap water is said to be just as good. Routine screening for prostate cancer using the so-called PSA test is said by those consulted not to extend people's lives. And x-rays for lower back pain. Some of these treatments can be quite invasive, time-consuming. There are simpler and as safe options, so why wouldn't you? Because I think what we've got is a culture of um, we can do something, therefore we should do something. I need to, need to stop and reflect and decide what is the best option for the patient in their individual circumstances. The list of treatments offering minimal benefit includes chemotherapy for patients with terminal cancer, the report says the disease won't be cured and there can be painful side effects. But some experts say it isn't a simple decision and it depends on the individual case. When someone's got an advanced cancer, if the chemotherapy is going to help them, you carry on with it. But if it's not going to help them, there is no point pursuing it. Treatment needs to be individualised to the person to help them live as well as possible for as long as possible. So this means having open, honest conversations about what's helping and what isn't helping, and also about what somebody's goals are for themselves. The Academy is urging patients not to make excessive demands for medical intervention and doctors to consider which treatments are really necessary, the aim being to make the best use of doctors' time and NHS resources. 
Hugh Pym, BBC News. Theresa May is holding talks about Britain's departure from the EU with the leaders of the devolved governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Downing Street says the Prime Minister will rebuff calls for a flexible Brexit, which would allow different parts of the UK to have their own arrangements. This report from our political correspondent, Carol Walker. Nicola Sturgeon came to Downing Street with a clear message. Scotland should be an equal partner in the Brexit negotiations. And if she doesn't get what she wants, she's prepared to call a second referendum on independence. Northern Ireland also voted to stay in the EU. And First Minister Arlen Foster has made it clear she wants to retain free movement for British and Irish citizens across their shared border after Brexit. Sir. Wales voted to leave the EU. But Welsh First Minister Carwyn Jones says full and unfettered access to the European single market should be central to the UK's negotiating position. In the Brexit talks, the Prime Minister is facing calls for an agreed negotiating position, which reflects the different views across the UK, with a vote in all four UK parliaments or assemblies on the negotiating framework. Access to the single market is vital to jobs and the economy across Scotland and that's why the First Minister will be making clear that there has to be an agreed position across the four constituent nations of the United Kingdom. Theresa May has said she wants this to be the start of a new grown-up relationship but it's also a reminder of how difficult it will be to reach an agreement that's acceptable not just across all parts of the European Union but across all parts of the United Kingdom too. There were smiles all round today, but it's clear the Prime Minister is not prepared to agree to all the demands on the table and the promise of more talks will not satisfy leaders who want a real say in the Brexit negotiations. Carol Walker, BBC News, Westminster. Well, let's get the very latest from our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, because, Norman, I think the talks have just ended. Do we have a sense of how difficult they were? Well, Jane, don't be confused by the warm words, the pleasantries, the cups of tea. These were difficult talks because Theresa May didn't want to stand up row with Nicola Sturgeon and the other. She's got enough on her plate when it comes to Brexit. But at the same time, she had to deliver a fairly blunt no to them on a whole list of demands. Above all, this idea of having separate deals for separate parts of the UK. Mrs May's view is that if the devolved administration start pursuing their own agenda, that will be confusing. More than that, it risks undermining her negotiation strategy. The concern there is it will mean a worse deal that she eventually gets, which will be worse for the whole of the UK. And there is also a view in government that the First Minister's suggestion of a second independence referendum if Scotland's forced to leave the single market is a bluff, that she wouldn't carry through on it because the view is that Scots are not really in the mood for a second referendum. More than that, Scotland relies more in terms of its trade with the rest of the UK than the EU. But it is an awfully big gamble because if Mrs May gets it wrong, then she risks being the Prime Minister who not only takes Britain out of the EU, but also potentially breaks up the Union of the United Kingdom. Norman, thank you. Norman Smith. A Belfast bakery which was found to have discriminated against a gay man by refusing to make a cake bearing a pro-gay marriage slogan has lost its challenge at Belfast's Court of Appeal. The judge said that the Christian baker's ashes wouldn't be endorsing the slogan by baking the cake. Our Ireland correspondent Chris Buckler has been following this and joins me from the court. Chris. Jane, this is a case that has made international headlines and become known as the Gay Cake Crowd. On one side, the Equality Commission and a customer who was refused a cake with pictures of the Sesame Street characters Bert and Ernie and the slogan, Support Gay Marriage. On the other, the Christian Institute and a family with deeply held religious beliefs. They said that they were not prepared to bake that cake because it could in some way show that they endorsed, supported same-sex marriage. However, the judges in this case ruled that wasn't the case. No more so than providing a cake for a particular team or portraying witches in a Halloween cake would indicate support for either of those. An order for a cake from this Belfast bakery has ended up in a legal case costing tens of thousands of pounds and a bitter battle involving rights and faith 
that returned to the courts today. The MacArthur family, who owned the Ashes Baking Company, had argued it was against their deeply held Christian beliefs to decorate a cake, with a message in support of gay marriage. But a court found they had discriminated against the customer on the grounds of his sexual orientation. And inside the appeal court today, three judges upheld that decision. That verdict was welcomed by Northern Ireland's Equality Commission, who have supported the customer, Gareth Lee, throughout the case. It clarifies the law and it means that anyone, whether you're straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, can walk in to receive a service without asking yourself the question, I wonder do the views that I hold, religious political views, or does my sexual orientation somehow conflict with those of the people that run this uh, organisation? This was the image that the MacArthur family objected to. But the court rejected their argument that to make the cake would in some way suggest that they endorsed gay marriage. We wouldn't decorate a cake with a pornographic picture or with swear words. We wouldn't even decorate a cake with a spiteful message about gay people because to do so would be to endorse and promote it. Same-sex marriage remains a contentious issue in Northern Ireland. It's the only part of the UK where it's not been legalised. It is not pro-Christian, it is anti- And campaigners were angered by the Democratic Unionist Party's decision to veto a vote in support of it at Stormont. But the balance between... The, the focus on this case has again brought politics, religion and rights into conflict. And the two sides walk away still holding very different beliefs. The original order for this cake was to cost £36.50. The Equality Commission today said that so far this case has cost them £88,000 of taxpayers' money. And of course that's not counting the amount of money it's cost the MacArthur family who have been supported throughout this by the Christian Institute. They are now deciding whether or not they want to try to appeal this to a higher court. This case, this row over a simple cake, may well not be done yet. Jim. Chris, thank you. Chris Butler. About four and a half million people in the UK have diabetes and the majority have type 2, which is linked to lifestyle and can be prevented. Diabetic care is already costing the NHS £10 billion every year. Public Health England is forecasting that there could be more than five million cases by 2035 if obesity rates continue to rise. Our correspondent Jamie Coulson reports from Bradford, where a tenth of the population is diabetic. Welcome to Bradford, diabetes capital of the UK. We in Bradford are in a unique situation because genetically people with South Asian background and other ethnic minority backgrounds, they are at more risk of developing type 2 diabetes and they are at more risk of developing this at an early age. So everyone in Bradford over 40 or over 25 if you're Asian has been invited in for a health assessment. Do you still have people who are blissfully unaware of the risk they could be putting themselves in? Yeah, it's mainly denial. Most of them say, oh, I can't be diabetic, uh, I'm always active. And I say to them that, look, you're in the red. And they says, oh, well, that just we have bad, bad few days, bad few months, we're going to start tomorrow. The aim is to find people who haven't yet developed the condition. Anyone with a high risk score is invited to a course. Swap it. Swap it. Don't stop it. Yes. They're not run by doctors, but by diabetes champions with personal experience of the condition. It's eight, nine years, I don't have any other problem. My kidney works fine. I'm not diagnosed with a risk of diabetes, anything, just because I'm careful my diet and my physical activities. 10% of NHS budget is spent on diabetes management and management of its complications. We know it's on the rise, and if we don't do anything in the next 10 years, 20% of NHS budget will be spent on diabetes management. So far, more than 25,000 people have been assessed, and Bradford's pioneering model has now been adopted as a national programme. Jamie Coulson, BBC News. Well, just to tell you that if you are watching in England, you can find out what's being done to fight diabetes where you live on Inside Out this evening. That's on BBC One, half past seven tonight. The time now is 19 minutes past one, our top story this lunchtime. The first migrants have left the jungle camp in Calais in advance of its demolition. They're being moved to refugee shelters across France. The authorities hope 3,000 of them will leave today. 
And victory in Chittagong. Ben Stokes steers England to a win over Bangladesh in the first test match. In South today, we look at diabetes in the South as Hampshire has one of the worst amputation rates in the country. And back to where it all began. 60s Soul tours the venues they began gigging 50 years ago. An undercover BBC investigation has discovered Syrian refugee children making clothes for British shoppers. Panorama investigated factories in Turkey and found that children had been working on clothes for Marks and & Spencer and the online retailer Assos. The brands say they don't tolerate exploitation or child labour. Dara McIntyre has this report. It's 8 a.m. in Istanbul, and Syrian refugees are hoping to be hired. So you can see there, just across the street, what we think is the middleman selecting his crew for today's work. The chosen ones get on the bus. The youngest is just 15 years old. They're dropped off at a factory that makes clothes for the British High Street. They don't have work permits, so they can only work illegally. After a long shift, they're paid on the street. Some get little more than a pound an hour, well below the Turkish minimum wage. I meet up with one of them later to find out what clothes they are working on. Can I see the labels? I don't remember the names exactly as I don't know English, but I have the labels with me. That's Marks and Spencer. That's an iconic British brand. Marks and Spencer said our findings were extremely serious and unacceptable to MS. It's offering permanent legal employment to all affected workers and says we will do all we can to ensure that this does not happen again. The situation with refugees in Turkey is complex, but critics say the big brands have to take responsibility. It's not enough to say, you know, we didn't know about this. It, it's not our fault. They have a responsibility to monitor and to understand where their clothes are being made and what conditions they're being made in. We also found younger children at work. We go inside this workshop, posing as the owners of a new fashion business, and we immediately spot something. A jacket with an ASOS label. And on the factory floor, we find Syrian children at work. ASOS says it has zero tolerance for child labour. The company accepts its clothes were made here, but says it's not an authorised factory. We are identifying them because ASOS has offered to financially support any child workers so they can return to school. In total, Panorama found evidence of Syrian refugees working illegally on clothes for five major brands. Dara McIntyre, BBC News. And you can see more about that story tonight on Panorama Undercover, the refugees who make our clothes. That's on BBC One this evening at half past eight. Kurdish Peshmerga fighters taking part in the battle against the so-called Islamic State group say they've cut off the town of Bashika, which lies on a crucial supply route into the city of Mosul. About 80 Islamic State-held villages and towns have been retaken in the first week of the offensive, bringing the Iraqi and Kurdish forces closer to the edge of the city itself, which is the last stronghold in Iraq of Islamic State. The amount of pollution in the atmosphere has crossed an important thre threshold and might not dip below it for many generations, according to the Global Authority on Weather. The World Meteorological Organization says record high greenhouse gas concentrations may destabilize the climate. Here's our environment analyst, Roger Harabin. Our Goldilocks planet. Not too hot, not too cold. Just right thanks to the invisible blanket of natural carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, keeping us warm. The normal level of carbon dioxide is 280 parts per million. But humans have changed the mix, powering our cities with fossil fuels that give out extra carbon dioxide. We've bumped up CO2 levels to 400 parts per million, a huge jump. And as emissions keep rising, 
Scientists warn we're taking a massive risk. 400 parts per million is a significant symbolic threshold below which we don't expect to go uh, for the rest of our lifetimes. It means we've really increased the amount of carbon dioxide we've put into the atmosphere significantly. Most of that increase has happened since 1950. If we want to stay below two degrees, we've already used two thirds of our budget. And again, most of that has happened now since 1950. So it means we've got a lot of work to do if we want to stay below two degrees. Carbon dioxide is a plant food. So for a while, parts of the planet are getting greener thanks to the extra fertilising carbon. But scientists warn that droughts are likely to wipe out the benefits of CO2 as the planet heats. Already temperatures have reached record levels. Politicians meeting in Paris last year promised to curb carbon dioxide emissions to protect the climate. But even they admit their efforts are too slow and too small. Roger Harriban, BBC News. A British banker accused of murdering two women at his apartment in Hong Kong has pleaded not guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility. 31-year-old Rurik Jutting, who grew up in Surrey, admitted manslaughter. The court was told he'd filmed the women on his phone before killing them. New research has found that just one practice session of heading a football can lead to an immediate decrease in brain function and a halving of memory recall. It's the first time that a direct link has been found immediately after a player has been practicing. The researchers from Stirling University now want to do more tests to assess whether there are longer term effects. Here's our sports correspondent, Katie Gornall. It's an integral part of the game. But now new research has found that every time a player does this, their brain is impaired. Scientists at the University of Stirling found that a player's memory can be affected for up to 24 hours by a short session of heading the ball. So we have a way here to assess whether there's sort of immediate changes in the brain. And what we can do is we can measure that by uh, looking at the signal as it travels from the brain to the leg. Three, two, one, and push, 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 keep pushing, pushing, pushing. So we measured people before and after they headed the football to see whether there was any change. We found that after heading the ball, the release of inhibitory chemicals in the brain was, was higher. OK, thank you for that, Jordan. We'll take it down to the sports field now. We can do some heading drills. The university is yet to investigate whether there are any long-term consequences, but their findings will fuel concerns that players' brains are being permanently damaged. In 2002, the former West Brom and England striker Jeff Astor died from a degenerative brain disease. His death was linked to heading old, heavy footballs, and his daughter is campaigning for further research into the issue. Once the results are there for everybody to see, it needs to be made clear to everybody so that footballers now or in the future can make informed choices. Today, another former England striker, Gary Lineker, revealed he never headed the ball in training because he was worried about the effects on his health. And when it comes to young players, some think it's time to copy the Americans and ban heading for children. In America, they were the first ones to look at it and uh, what they've done is they've taken uh, heading the ball out of the game for younger kids. We haven't done that yet over here and that might be the way ahead. Scientists have discussed the issue of brain health in contact sports for some time. Rugby has taken action. Now could it be football's turn? Katie Gornall, BBC News. England's cricketers have narrowly beaten Bangladesh in the first test in Chittagong. Man of the match Ben Stokes took two wickets in quick succession to seal victory by 22 runs. England's captain Alastair Cook described Stokes as an X-factor cricketer who every team would love to have. Richard Conway reports. For Bangladesh, this was a chance to earn their test match stripes. Just 33 runs short of victory, they entered day five of this absorbing contest against England, hoping to claim only their eighth ever test victory. Over Bairstow. The early exchanges gave rise to local hopes they could achieve an historic win. With two wickets needed, English nerves meanwhile began to jangle. But then Ben Stokes removed Tigel Islam after he moved too far across his stumps. And two balls later, the Durham all-rounder finished the job. Was there a shot? With Shafil Islam trapped LBW. 
After five days of close contest, the Bangladeshi challenge ended in disappointing fashion. The England captain, meanwhile, was left to reflect on man of the match Ben Stokes and his star quality performance. Ben, you know, he's, that's why he's an X-Factor player, isn't he? Like the way he batted in the second innings um, and the way he bowled in the first innings, you know, changed the game for us. And for the man himself, a career high display. Definitely my best. The runs that I got was, you know, um, you know, different to, to sort of how I've got runs in the past for England. Uh, it was more sort of, you know, occupying the crease and, and spending time in there and not giving my wicket away and, and making sure that we got it to a good lead. Despair then for Bangladesh, but relief for England, with both sides now hoping for improvement when they meet again this Friday in their second and final test. Richard Conway, BBC News. Now let's take a look at the weather prospects. Jay Wynn has joined me. Hello. Thanks, Jane. We're going to start off out in the Atlantic with a small group of islands known as the Azores, where you can see there's quite a lot of isobars in the charts. It's been really windy. The wind's coming down from the north because we've got this area of low pressure to the west, and a huge sea fetch has resulted in some very, very high seas. Earlier today, we saw the waves peaking at around about 15 metres, which is indeed taller than three double-decker buses, so quite uh, incredible weather here. Thankfully, it's been much quieter back on our shores, but a lot of cloud in the sky across the southern half of the UK. And indeed, in the southwest of England, we've seen uh, quite a bit of rain so far. And the southwest of England is a focal point for some uh, heavier downpours over the next few hours, and some of that might just creep its way into the south of Wales as well. Thunder, lightning and a risk of some localised flooding here. But the further north and west you go, actually, it's a lovely afternoon across central and western parts of Scotland. Eastern Scotland at risk of a few showers, as is the northeast of England. But the northwest does very well, as does most of Northern Ireland. It's a largely dry picture here. North Wales might begin to brighten up, but generally there's a fair bit of cloud across the southern half of the UK. A lot of dry weather underneath that, but in the southwest, as we've seen, well, we've got potential for thunder and lightning. And as I said, there is the risk of some localised flooding problems. But as we go through the evening, the rain eventually becomes lighter and more patchy, drifts its way further east as well, so there'll be some rain for a time across the far southeast. Further north and west, with clearer skies, temperatures will be dropping away. It is going to turn quite chilly generally into single figures for major town cities, but in the north and west, more rural spots will well into uh, minus figures, so it will be quite cold, and there'll be some frost uh, and some fog to go with that. So, uh, we start on a chilly note on Tuesday, but actually there's going to be a lot of dry and bright weather to be had for the northern half of the UK. The southern half starts fairly cloudy, a few early showers, but by afternoon, most places are fine and dry, and 10 to uh, 15 or so degrees will be the afternoon highs. Then through the evening, towards the northwest, the winds start to pick up ahead of an area of rain, which is heading our way. Now, that's uh, fairly significant because it is a, a weather front which is coming our way. It's going to bring a fairly, fairly a breezy day on Wednesday, but it's also going to bring the winds in from the west. So things are going to turn milder through the middle part of the week. Milder, yes, but a fair bit of cloud and some rain to go with that and breezy conditions too. But very little rain gets towards the southeast through the middle part of the week. And it's mild, 15 or 16 degrees here. Similar sort of day on Thursday. Might see some dense fog for a time early on in the south. But again, the south stays largely dry. The further north and west you go, it's uh, that bit windier and a bit wetter too. Jay, back to you. Thanks very much, Jay. Thank you. Just a reminder of our main story here this lunchtime. The first migrants have left the jungle camp in Calais in advance of its demolition. They're being moved to refugee shelters across France. That is all from the BBC News at One, so it's goodbye from me. And on BBC One, we join the BBC's news teams wherever you are. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.